composition and catastrophe. Um, it's an evening that suits beginners or older members that have got more, far more experience can refresh their memory. So thank you very much and over to you, Chris. Okay, lovely. Let's, thanks for having me along tonight. Let's just do the technical bit. Um, see if this can share the screen. Lovely. PowerPoint is playing. Cool. Right. That's the, uh, that'll be the swearing down to the minimum then. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, so, oh, so this talk comes from a, a strange place, really. Um, a few years back, um, we had a beginners group at Harlow Camera Club. And I did a talk for them and Malcolm, who was the chairman there, phoned me up the following day and he said, oh, he said, I like that talk you did for the beginners. He said, um, can you do it for the whole club? I said, yeah, sure. He said, um, can you make it last the whole night? And I said, well, you want me to take a 25 minute talk and make it last an hour and a half, two hours? And he went, yeah, shouldn't be a problem, should it? Um, so... <laughs> I had to think about it, and what I came up with um, was what you're going to get tonight. So what you've got is you've got two completely separate talks. Um, the first half is aimed at beginners and is all about composition, but the second half is on a completely different subject. So if you hated the first half, hang around, you might hate the second half even more, okay? Um, so let's start talking about composition. Um, let's talk about, well, we can't avoid it really. Let's talk about the rules of composition. And um, so I was thinking about how we introduce these rules of composition. And uh, I, I thought probably the best thing to do was maybe take some beginner's work and show what they've done wrong and um, how they could improve their composition and and uh, just and because it's a camera club, we might as well give them a mark out of twenty while we're there as well. So, um, so our first beginner um, gave us this portrait. Now, um, when we look at this, we first see this portrait, and it works for most of us. We've got this lovely enigmatic smile, good eye contact, hands in a good position. But then, after a while we start looking around and we notice that coming out of her shoulder, shoulder is a road. And then she's got a bridge coming out of her neck up here and a mountain coming out of her head. It's all very distracting. And one thing we do know about camera club judges is that they are very easily distracted. And um, so it's a good effort. Uh, and I'll give Leonardo that. It's a good effort, good first attempt at a portrait, but really um, what he should have done is use um, a lower F number um, to give himself a shallower depth of field, uh, blur the background, something like that. And I think we can all see that that massively improves the uh, this this job. So um, it's a good, like I say, it's a good effort. I'm going to have to give him a 17 on tonight's um, uh, range. Um, next up um, is a shot by a young lad by the name of Edward. Um, and uh, the title for this is, is the screen. And we have a person here, maybe they're hearing a scream, uh, maybe they're screaming themselves, or if you're me and you look at it for long enough, maybe it's just a spaniel. Um, anyway, um, so what's he done wrong here? Well, we've got the subject slap bang in the middle, you know, and, and we know it'd be stronger if the subject was on the thirds. And then we've got this, this lot of red up the top, very distracting. We don't need all of that to take us away from the main subject down here. And finally, worst of all, we've got this big red line down the side of the side of the picture, which is awful. You know, it just really drags the eye out. So I think what we should have done there, um, and like I say, it's a very good effort, but if, if you just um, cropped it properly, and put the subject on the third, something like that. I think that would have been much better as far as everybody's concerned. 
Um, but I'm going to give that an 18 because I, I, I think it's an original composition. Um, and our final one for tonight is a, is a local lab to me. Um, and um, so now this is a good landscape, good quality landscape, uh, sharp front to back as it should be, good exposure in the sky and under the trees, very well handled exposure. But as we look around the picture, we start to see that this house has been chopped in half. And that's like a cardinal scene. You should never chop things in half, you know, either in the picture or out of the picture. Um, and um, uh, But when we see the title, the title is um, The Haywain. And it's not really given it to us is this there's more of the scene than we need really because the interesting bit is going on between this dog here and the hay wain itself and so if it was me i think i would think it would be much better if it was cropped something like this and i think we can see there we've got the the, the dog on the edge of the picture looking at the looking at the boy and i think that tells a much better story uh, but I'm going to give it a 19 on tonight's anyway. So, hopefully, um, you can see that the idea that there are rules of composition that you must follow is a bit daft. Um, people talk about the rules, and there aren't really any rules, because um, it's art. You have to do what feels right and what works for you. But... What composition is, and I think this is the way I understand it, is it's actually a toolbox, a set of tools you can use to make your pictures a little bit more interesting. So um, let me give you an example of that. Now, this is a, a picture of a beach in Cornwall. I would love to say that I thought, oh, I'm doing a talk on composition. I'd better take an awful photo to start off with. No, this is me turning up to a beach with a camera and a tripod and thinking, oh, what happens if I take that shot? Mm, no, it's not really working for me. But after about um, 10, 15 minutes of using the various tools of composition, I went to something like this. Now, hopefully you think this is a better picture than this one. If you like this one, probably see if you can get yourself a space on the judge's workshop, because um, you're clearly qualified as a judge. Uh, but what did I do to make the picture a bit more interesting? Well, first of all, I went from, I got myself some foreground interest. Um, and then I decided to slide the um, sky up to the top of the picture, uh, making it all about the all about the sea rather than the sky. Because um, if you've got a 50-50 split, we're not quite sure what you want to see. And then um, we use these as leading lines to drag the eye into the picture. And we use some shutter speed to blur it and give us a bit of action in there. All of these tools just made that beach, that dull, uninteresting beach, a little bit more interesting than it otherwise would be. So where are these compositional tools? What are these compositional tools we can use? Well, let's start off with intent. What is it we intend the viewer to see? Uh, and one of the first questions we can ask ourselves is whether we want to go simple or complex. So, you know, if in doubt, leave it out. So photography is a reductive art. Yeah. Um, painting's easy. Yeah. Painting, you start with a white sheet of paper, you slap the paint on it till you get the image you want. Um, photography is completely different. You start with the whole world in front of you, and then we crop it and position ourselves till we get exactly what we want to show. It's closer to sculpture in that you remove all the bits that aren't Michelangelo's David until you get to Michelangelo's David. And it's the same thing with um, uh, photography. You know, it's what you leave out is just as important as what you put in. You know, so if, you, if you're going to show an idea, just show that idea, just show that single person, try to avoid the distractions in it. Um, alternatively, we might decide to go complex. We might like a picture with a lot of stuff in it, a lot going on. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just as good. Um, simple tends to work better in competitions because it's got less time for you to work with. Uh, complex, 
probably more fun if you put it on your wall um because uh, i've got a picture of um uh, uh, a beach and it's got about 300 people on it at home and it's on the wall and every time i walk past it i know it's somebody doing something different you know a complex picture can be more interesting um but even with a picture like this where it's um you know it's a lot going on i've chosen to take the color out because when we add the color back in it becomes there's almost too much for us to understand what it is that the photographer wants to see um, and one of the ways we can simplify stuff is to isolate our subject you know just have the single thing that we want us to show you using maybe mist or um, reflections or cropping or even just use depth of field to just isolate the thing we want to the people to see um, another decision we need to make is whether we want to be obvious or obscure and this is a lot of these decisions you can kind of make after the event but generally with this one you've got to make it before you press the shutter um how do i mean well this is a, a blindingly obvious picture of tower bridge um but equally this is tower bridge still but a completely unobvious and it makes the viewer work at what they're looking at and what it is they decide to work at Another key decision we probably need to make before we press the shutter is whether we're going to shoot portrait or landscape. Now, most beginning photographers I see pick up their camera, hold it to their eye, and they're immediately taking the shots, standing up like that. It's fine, nothing wrong with that. But why not take the effort to also turn the camera and take some shots like that? Because to me, something like this can look completely different. To something like that even though i was standing in exactly the same place i have a slightly different feel to them um and um i take a lot of landscapes and stuff in portrait mainly because that way it doesn't squash your nose against the back of the camera um another another reason for um taking both is if you're doing layouts or uh, frame pictures of multiple pictures Odds on you're going to need one the other way around to what you've actually taken. So why not take both, especially in a digital world? It doesn't cost much. It doesn't cost any different difference, really. Um, here's, a, here's a shot in Bow Grape Mill of um, illustrate the same thing. So this is it in landscape. Here's the same mill in portrait. Um, if you're ever looking for foreground interest, these Jessup's inflatable swans are brilliant. You just put them on and they just uh, get right in the foreground where you need them. Um, so composition is the is the art of imposing structure on a chaotic world now that's what we do as photographers we look for structure in all this chaos in front of us and we can find that structure in say horizontal and vertical lines what i mean well we can find some horizontal lines in the landscape and that will give us an image based on completely horizontal. Alternatively, we can look for verticals. So maybe we can find some ver set of vertical lines in the, in, the, in the landscape or in our scene. And that's how we've imposed that structure. Another form of geometry that's quite popular is triangles. Two things about triangles. One is that they give you perspective um so even though you know you know that the parallel lines are, are joining together and so as things get smaller further away you get some sort of perspective but the other thing is i quite often feel they've got a sense of movement um i don't know if it's just me but i look at this triangle and i expect it to start moving up the spring um or maybe i've just seen the um titles of dad's army too many times i don't know but um Triangles can certainly add some impact into your image that otherwise wouldn't be there. And a sense of movement, a um, sense of forging forward. So we can combine the triangles and the parallel lines and we can, can use diagonals. And these are really powerful. So this is a staggeringly dull picture of a railway floor. Um, but by getting the angle, so as we had all those diagonals across here like that, um we get a bit more energy in the image you know, if those were horizontal 
lines, you wouldn't, you'd have to sort of step over them to get through the image, whereas the diagonals kind of carry you through it. And the nice thing is the diagonals as they hit the edge give you triangles too for free. Um, similarly, this is a this is a staggeringly dull picture of a jetty, but by turning the camera, um, I get this lovely diagonal through the picture and loads of diagonals there, just adding a bit more interest to the picture, just making it a little bit more interesting than it otherwise would be. And we can find a set of diagonals in, in space and use them to link disparate, in, disparate items together. So this is one you'll always hear judges banging on about, and this is leading lines. Um, what's a leading line? Well, the idea with a leading line is, oh, oh yeah, what's that? Oh, some weird firing up in my screen. Um, so the idea is that when we look at something like that, um, our eye runs along the fence, then along the river and into the scene, something like that. Um, and leading lines can be natural items or maybe man-made items. Something like this has got loads and loads of leading lines, a huge, great lead into the center there. Um, and even another one here, dragging your eye right into the middle of that picture, which if I'd even thought about it, would have a model standing there in some outlandish outfit. Um, and we can use leading lines to link our foreground with our background. So um, here we have some interesting foreground. Background uh, is also interesting with a nice sunset. And this leading line takes our eye up the, uh, what is that, fence? I don't know, piling, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, takes, you, takes the eye up the piling and gives you a leading to join the two parts of the picture, the foreground and the background. Similarly, if we can find a set of parallel lines, um, because we instinctively know that um, parallel lines meet at infinity. And, and so we look at something like that and we instantly know that that's not a, a little person, that's um, you know, a person far away because of the lines are converging towards them. Um, and so that is what you know, helps give the user, the viewer a clue as to this two dimensional image they're, they're seeing what the three-dimensional world is like. And leading lines can help you do that. They don't even have to even be straight. And you can find a curve that drags the eye straight into the picture, something like that. Um, so these are S curves. You'll see these um, from time to time. Lovely sweeping line dragging your eye through the image. Um, you know, to be honest, if you're not tempted to get your camera out when you see a nice wiggly S like that or like that, it's um, well probably best to uh, sell your camera, I reckon. Um, anyway, so just giving you a big gob of theory. And one of the questions I've been asked when I do, do, do this talk before is how do you, um, how do you decide whether you're going to do this you know, in camera or in Photoshop or cropping it afterwards or, or whatever. So what I thought I'd do is I'd, I'd give a, a little sort of insight into um, how how I do it. Um, and of course, I'm I'm not the authority on these things. You do what works for you. But um, so this was uh, one New Year's morning uh, down at Southwold and. I got there and I had the place to myself first thing and I got there well before dawn um, and so although this looks bright it's a long exposure because um, it was so dark but the uh, the sun's slowly coming up and uh, got some light so I've put my camera down and I've taken this as my first shot and compositionally I'm not really sure what it was I was actually trying to do I think we've got the pier here, which is, is, is reasonably interesting. Far too much sky going on, to be fair. Um, and then this seems to be an also ran kind of idea, and I'm not quite sure where that should be in the picture. So I took that, and I, I kind of didn't really like it much. So I decided to, oh, I don't know, maybe let's move the other side of the pier. And 
That's, that's a little bit more interesting, possibly. We've got this sort of foreground triangle of um, gravel, which uh, adds some interest. And now we've got some layers. We've got this layer of um, rocks followed by the pier. But there's not really the separation between them. You kind of need a bit, a bit higher or a bit further back um, in order to get some. Otherwise, if you look at it carefully, it looks like the pier's stuck on top of the rocks. Um, so I've gone to the right of the rocks. I've gone to the left of the rocks. So what happens if I go onto the middle of the rocks? Now, this first of all, let me explain. This is a really dark image because what you are seeing here is my unprocessed raw images. Right? Nobody ever shows you their unprocessed raw images. Um, it's like looking through somebody's underwear drawer. Um, and I, but I thought I'd show this because certainly for beginners, I think everybody gets they're downhearted that their pictures that come off the camera don't look that great. Well, quite often, um, everybody's pictures that don't look that great. So don't worry about it. You know, you can you can get these things better. But um, I'm on the on the pile of uh, rocks there and it's kind of OK. We got this is a, a sort of wedge shape leading in here and another sort of triangle leading in here. But we've got this big area of nothing going on here. And I don't know, it really wasn't working for me. So I decided that maybe this, I should go the other side of the pier. And it's the way these things work. <coughs> Suddenly, I immediately had a lot more luck. Um, so this, um, to me, I feel it works. Um, the sky is a not particularly interesting sky that day. Um, there was just this one sort of UFO-shaped cloud that I could use. And we've got the pier sort of wedge-shaped straight into the... Uh, the sort of subject as it were we've got some lovely light reflecting in the um in the water itself and probably i would crop that say up here somewhere down there something like that and i'd get an image that i was you know pretty happy with maybe even crop it as a panoramic something like that um so i was happy with that and now <laughs> I, I tend not to stay in one place or take one particular, keep taking the same shot. I'll move about and throw what I call work the scene. Um, other photographers clearly are much better at composition than I am because um, one guy turned up where I started on the left-hand side, um, set his camera up, and he didn't move for the whole of the um, uh, time it took for the sun to come up. Similarly, just after I took this, two people turned up and they set their tripods up behind me, um, or behind where I was, and they again started taking photos and didn't move the whole time. Uh, clearly, they got the right composition first time. Well, I can't really do that. I'm no good at that. Um, so I have to move about and find compositions that work for me. So I moved up here and I thought, well, we've got some foreground interest here. Um, and this sort of leads towards the, uh, the cloud, which is nice. Got this um, the pier leading towards the cloud. It's okay. I don't know. It doesn't really inspire me too much. But um, you know, there's stuff there. And the thing with if you're doing anything with lead-ins or um, jetties or piers or stuff like that, take a step to the left or a step to the right and see what difference it makes to the shot. Um, and take both shots because quite often they look okay on the back of the camera, but they're not quite. They don't quite work when you actually get them home. So, you know, try a different angle. And especially if you're a beginner, it does take moving about a bit to get the shot you want. So I decided to a change of tack. Instead of using the pier as kind of a leading line, let's kind of use it as a background and use it um, as a yeah background to the uh, movement of the water. So I set my shutter speed to get some uh, movement. Um, well, I say I set my shutter speed to get some movement. I've tried a shutter speed, then adjusted it, and then tried it again, and then adjusted it until I got the look I wanted. Um, again, I've shot with photographers uh, who seem to just be able to go, oh, yeah, that, I need a quarter of a second. Um, I can't do that. I have to look at it and see what, see if it does what I want at the particular time. But again, this is, is probably a keeper. <coughs> You've got some nice drama in the foreground. Um, 
The sky isn't actually as burnt out as it looks on your screen. I could probably recover some of that um, uh, from the raw file. Um, definitely got some exposure there. It's definitely got some colour there. But it's a it's a reasonable shot of the of the um, sea. Um, I say you're messing about with um, shutter speed. You know, sometimes you can go too much or too little. Um, it's uh, to me, it's just a thing you need to experiment with what works with the waves that you've got and how fast they're coming in. Um, but moved along, and and this time I, I, I'm trying a bit more with these these groins going out to sea. And we've got this this foreground triangle. We've got some foreground interest here, but everything seems to be leading you out of the picture. This this leading line takes you right off out of there. And I mean, if it really should be pointing sort of over here somewhere. Um, and the, the pier's okay as a background, but it doesn't go all the way across. And it's, it's, I don't know, it's just not really working for me. Um, so in the end, just as the sun started to come up, I turned to um, one side, I turned to the other side and uh, I got this shot as the sun came up. Now, this for me works. I'm not particularly sure why it works better than many any of the others I took that day. Um, I mean, the sun's over here on the sort of kind of on the thirds, which kind of works nicely. Um, and these are just add a bit of interest out to sea and they're not clashing with anything else. Um, like I said, these are raw files. Look at that, you've got a bit of rubbish there that, um, you know, if you didn't clone that out, the judge would definitely tell you to clone it out, that's for sure. And that was kind of going to be it for um, that day, that morning's shooting. But um, there's a thing Joe McNally says, which is never pack up your gear until you've left the venue. And so I I took that um, to heart because I, I walked back with me um, camera on the tripod and just as I walked past the pier I saw this scene again this this works for me this is a you know a, a sunburst through the window um you've got lots of sort of foreground lines almost parallel lines coming in there and and it becomes a I think there's quite an interesting scene on its own but again um not one to leave things as they are I thought maybe what happens if I try a bit more um, some more stuff in the foreground. And to me, this doesn't work anywhere near as well. There's too much going on. Um, and so sometimes, you know, you don't have to use all these ideas. You just use one or two that, that will make your picture more interesting. And would have been it, three or four decent shots from a, a morning. That's pretty much all I expect. Um, but as I wandered back to the um, the car, I walked past a... Um, beach hut and I saw this in the window and it gave me an idea so I decided to spend the next 20 minutes just photographing the windows of beach huts and created myself a little collection and this is a this is an idea you see in art photography much more than you see in club photography this idea of a collection where the, the collection becomes more interesting than each of the individual items in it um, and so that was it that was one one morning shooting um, you know, certainly different, but hopefully that gives you an idea of the process that you kind of go through with these, whether you're going to crop them before or after, where you decide and work in the scene. Right, so that's the interlude over. Back to more theory. So there's this idea of allowing the viewer to enter the space, allowing the viewer to walk into your picture. So if we get a shot something like that, the theory goes that you walk up to there and mentally you hang yourself over the fence and you just look. Whereas if you open the gate, it becomes more inviting. You want to walk through along that path. That's the theory. Um, in practice, does it make a difference? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but if you're going to take a picture and there's a gate in it, why not try and open it just, for, uh, uh, just to see if it improves the picture and improves the feel of it? Um, space to move into this is one where the idea is if you've got something moving like say uh, sammy the surfing seal um you need to give him room to move within your picture um similarly with this lady kicking pigeons uh, you need to get the idea that she's got space to walk carry on through the picture 
if she was walking out of it, you wouldn't quite understand what was going on. But as she's walking through, you kind of understand that she's scaring the pigeon and that she's got room to move through the picture. Colours. Um, Colours are an important way of adding structure to our images. So we can find two disparate objects, two disparate things, and link them together with colour. Um, similarly, we can just capture a light or a tone and just make everything about that single colour. Or finally, we can uh, just take out the colour completely and go for black and white to show the texture and the contrast of the thing that is we're photographing. I wish I could remember who the quote's from, but um, a photographer has said once that if you photograph somebody in colour, you photograph their clothes. If you photograph them in black and white, you photograph their soul. Um, which I think is quite a, well, I don't know, it's a good quote. I don't know if it means anything, but it's nice. Um, so now we come to the bit kind of you're all familiar with, the placement of the subject in the frame. This is um, this is the idea that if we take the subject and we slap it smack bang in the middle of the sub middle of the frame, it gives you a competent picture, but it's not hugely interesting because you've got these sort of you've divided the picture into four equal lumps and there's no real tension in it at all, something like that. So what do we do? How do we get tension? How do we surprise the viewer, make the viewer think? Well, what happens if we say, take the take the subject and put it right slap bang on the far, far right hand corner on the edge of our frame? Well, now that picture becomes a bit more interesting um, because it's a leaf off to one side. But, and here's the thing, um, now the viewer's starting to think, well, what's going on here? What's all this rubbish over here? Why? Why is he giving me a compl completely empty frame over here? Um, so it becomes interesting, but it also looks a bit like you missed the shot. So what we get is this Goldilocks zone, which is not too close to the middle and not too close to the edge. And when we put our subject there, it quite often becomes more interesting. Um, so the codification of this, um, comes as the rule of thirds, right? You knew it was coming. Um, and you would hear a lot of tosh spoken about the rule of thirds, right? Um, you would hear people talk about the golden mean, the golden ratio, all of that. Well, I wouldn't listen to a word of it because all it is is a simple codification of that thing that I've just told you, that it's not too near the middle, not too near the edge. Yeah, so if we look at this leaf, you could argue this leaf is on the thirds. I was going to explain the rule of thirds for anybody who's missed it. The idea is you divide your frame into thirds. Um, so you've got lines this way and this way. And the idea is if the subject is on one of these lines, it's a stronger image. Um, and if it's on the intersection of those two lines, it's an even stronger image. Um, well, when we look at this leaf, where exactly is it? Is it on the thirds or is it, is it near the, near the centre? Is it too near the edge? You know, it's not actually on the thirds, it's on the golden ratio. It's, it's on, the, on the Goldilocks zone. Um, similarly, shot like this. Yeah, it's slap bang on the thirds. Um, but that's, that's just a, a tool, just a way for you to help you stop putting your sub, subject right in the middle of the frame. Um, and also, if you ever read a book or a display or a talk or anything about composition and they bring up something like this, right, there is absolutely no chance that they thought of that diagram before they press the, uh, press the button. They didn't. It just doesn't happen. Nobody, nobody in history, apart from... Um, still life photographers and or somebody who can completely arrange everything to their heart's content has seen a scene and thin thinks all oh, that fits the golden ratio perfectly doesn't happen um so moving on placement in the frame negative space so you hear artists talk about this a lot more than photographers but what's negative space well it's the space around a uh, a subject so here's a 
not particularly interesting picture of my nephew, but we can make it a bit more interesting by giving it huge gobs of negative space. Um, and this is right over here, um, all this free space over here. And um, so this has immediately broken the rules I've just told you, because he's not in the Goldilocks zone. He's over on the edge there where it's um, uncomfortable and I don't feel quite right. But that's OK. It's art. You can decide what it is you want to do as long as you have a clue why you're doing it. Um, in this case, we were going to stick some advertising text down this side. So it works for that. But with portraits, I tend to give a lot of uh, negative space. I tend to like the space around my subject and push the subject to one side. Not particularly sure why. Um, although I didn't know in this, this particular one, um, this, uh, this guy, to, they both came over from Tokyo 15 years ago. And finally, his, his, his mate went back um, and he was left here. So when we photographed him, we stuck him over one side and, and lit the space where he's not, um, where, where his friend's not, so as he looked a bit more lonely. But yeah, I, I tend to like pushing um, people over to one side. Well, this is a this is a one for you. Um, so, in the modern world where we're doing projected image, and you've got a 20, 25, 50 megapixel camera, you do not need. Um, to worry too much about cropping. So this shot's done very well for me in competition and judges say how, how beautifully lit it is and how much time I must have spent in the studio and stuff like that. If they ever saw the original shot, they would be a bit surprised, yeah? Um, because this is just a shot taken in a, uh, an Extinction Rebellion demo, but because we, in the modern world, because we, we've got these so many megapixels and you need so few megapixels for projected image comps, you can crop really viciously. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to crop, if, especially if you're not printing it. Um, disrupting the pattern. So this is the idea that if we have a pattern of stuff, um, if we make one a bit different, the, the image becomes a bit more interesting. Um, I hope you can imagine if that was a white powder, it wouldn't quite have the same effect. Um, oh, yeah, fruit polos, really hard to get hold of. They're like rocking horse drop-ins, they're really difficult. Um, anyway, um, another similar pattern shot that um, our idea that I think I came up with, I don't think anybody else has put this in a com uh, composition book, but is the idea of the full stop. And this is the, the idea that if you start reading left to right this picture, you uh, you come along the uh, the pattern, you've got this repeating pattern, and suddenly we're surprised at the end of it by something completely different. I know what you're saying, I don't believe you. Well, that's fine. Um, do, me a, do me a favor, just hold your thumb up and cover up the, the man, right? Isn't that the dullest picture you've ever seen in your life without him in it, yeah? It's really, really dull. Just adding that that sort of bit of excitement at the end of the picture makes it a, a little bit more interesting, breaks the pattern. Um, and, you know, that's all we can aim for sometimes is to make things a little bit more interesting. Uh, the 80-20 rule. Um, this is the idea that instead of putting the horizon slap bang across the middle, um, we need to decide whether we're gonna um, push it up or push it down. So is a picture like this all about the sea? Or is this picture all about the sky? Yeah, we make that decision for the viewer rather than them having to decide what it is we're trying to show. And we push the horizon rather than always leave it in the middle, consciously decide where it's going to be. Now, moving on, we get to exposure technique because you hear a lot of stuff about the right exposure. Well, what does exposure allow us to do in a, in a modern world of cameras that can pretty much do it for us anyway? Well, exposure... Uh, technique allows you to control depth of field. Um, what is depth of field? Well, it's the amount of the picture that's acceptably sharp. So in a shot like this, it's this area. Yeah, The foreground down here is out of focus and the background is out of focus, but the core part of the picture is in focus. Now, we control depth of field through um, the length of the lens we use, the distance to the subject, um, and the F number, right? And uh, beginners tend to get 
obsessed by the F number, um, like it's a magical thing. But basically, the longer your lens, the less depth of field you got. Um, the the closer you are to the subject, the less depth of field you have got. Um, and the F number on top of that doesn't always make that much difference. It's just a, a, a small change um, quite often after you've nailed the first two. Um, and so, but if you want to understand F numbers, um, the easiest way to understand it is if you increase the F number, you increase the depth of field. So F2.8 is a low number, low depth of field. F22, 22 is a high number, high depth of field. Increase the F number, increase the depth of field. Um, I'll give you an example of this. This is two pictures taken on the uh, same day. Um, so this is taken with a 28 mil lens, I think something like that. Um, so that's a short lens, which gives us lots and lots of depth of field. Um, then I'm, I'm focusing into the picture somewhere, something like that, so two, three hundred yards away. So that again gives us loads and loads of depth of field. And the F number, it was probably F8, something like that. Doesn't really matter. The first two will give us all that whole picture in sharpness. Similarly, um, there's a picture of my mum's boots. Um, she always asks, I mean boots in this presentation. Um, and um, so this is taken with a 200 mil lens. So that's a long lens, which already means you've got less depth of field. And it's focusing in its minimum focus distance, which again means that it's got a lot less depth of field. And so the actual only amount of depth of field we've got is only this sort of short area here around about the feet. Um, and then the F number again is probably F8. It doesn't really matter that much compared to the other two parts. Now, the other side of the artistic of the exposure triangle is shutter speed. Now, um, so how do you control shutter speed? Well, if you increase the F number, you not only increase the depth of field, you increase the time it takes to take the picture. So it's increase, increase, increase. Um, but also you can put dark filters over the front to make it take longer, which is what I did with this shot. Um, so I don't know how long the actual exposure for this is, but what I can tell you, this is the sea, so there will normally be waves, but the waves are flattened out because it's such a long exposure. How long is it? Well, while I was taking the photo, a dog came down here, somebody threw a ball for it, it jumped in there, swam all the way out to there, turned around and got the ball, turned around and got out. Yeah, that's how long the exposure was. But the best bit about it is, is if you look at those birds, they didn't move the entire time. <laughs> They're completely still. Um, so long exposure can give you an artistic impression. Similarly, we can freeze action by choosing the shutter speed of our choice. Um, and we can get a fast shutter speed by increasing the ISO, um, which adds noise sometimes, but you know, these things are always compromises. Other compositional ideas for you? Words. If you've got words in your picture, people can't help but read it. Yeah. Uh, unless it's a foreign language that they don't understand. But, you know, make sure that if there are any words, they are the things you want people to read and people to understand. A um, friend of mine's got a picture and it's a lovely picture out to see. And on every groin, it says, keep off the rocks, keep off the rocks, keep off the rocks, keep off the rocks. And that's all I can see. I can just see what is there. So make sure you're showing, you know, any words is what you actually want to show. The symmetry, uh, symmetry is basically a pattern. Um, you know, it's just a, a, a pattern of two. Um, and like any pattern, maybe we should disrupt it, see if it makes it more interesting. Put in the frame. If we want to show a lot of something, take the stuff to the edge of the frame. Now we see this and we think, oh, there's loads and loads of Cadbury cream eggs there, uh, mini eggs there. Um, there's not, there are exactly the number you can see, um, which is a lot less than I started off with. Um, and similarly, similarly with these um, gingerbread men, you know, you think this is part of a big pile of gingerbread men because we see it and our mind instantly thinks there's loads of them. Again, it's not, it's exactly the number of gingerbread 
of men they were on the train. Um, if you want a recipe for boring pictures, stand up and take all your pictures at eye high. You know, um, if you want something interesting, maybe get up high, look down on the beach, or maybe get down low, lay on the beach and see what you get. Lay on, lay in a field and get eye to eye with a, a buttercup. You know, these can make your pictures more interesting. And uh, foreground interest. So landscape photography spe specifically is the constant search for foreground interest. We're constantly looking for things like icebergs to stick in the foreground uh, or maybe even some tires because now this gives us that that depth into the picture. Yeah, Don't forget we're, we're showing people a two-dimensional art form of a three-dimensional world. So we've got the tires in the foreground um, we know that they're smaller than this boat and we know these boats must be further away because they're smaller than that. Suddenly we force perspective on the view and we kind of understand it. So, and especially if you, if you've got, if you ever get out your kit bag, your ultra wide angle lens, then you're going to discover that things are a lot further away than you could possibly imagine with a wide angle lens. And you need to get up close and really hug up close to a rock to give you the, the shot you want. Or maybe, you know, just find a, um, a tugboat or something like that to stick in the foreground. Um, so this, this is a view of the Millennium Bridge uh, and a boat going underneath it. Um, it's not particularly interesting, but if you take your hand and cover up the bottom half of the picture so you just see the boat, it's a lot more interesting with the foreground interest in it. Um, just adds something to it, adds a depth to it. Otherwise, it's just a picture of a boat coming along. This gives you, you know, some context to it and, and gives you that three-dimensionality. Um, so this, this is one I, I lay claim to having invented. Well, I haven't really invented it, but I've never heard anybody else talk about it. And uh, this is this idea that if you get parallel strips of cloud over your head and you use an ultra wide angle lens you get this x shape and if you get water you can get it reflected in the water to point at whatever it is you want to take the picture of so um the thing with the x um is that you can really overdo it quite quickly uh, and have far too many x's in your shot so that's kind of everything i wanted to show you and talk about composition tonight um, when you're taking your shots, first of all, decide what it is you want to show the viewer and then try to work out if you can leave other stuff out because that's, you know, extraneous stuff is only going to distract your attract the viewer. And then think of these various compositional tools, you know, one or maybe two, uh, of how they can make the picture a little bit more interesting. And will they help you tell the story that you want to tell? You know, and like I say, we work in a, in a digital world these days, so it doesn't matter how many shots you take, you're going to have a chance to try this stuff, retry it, um, and, and work out which of these tools work for a particular image. Um, book I always recommend, I've got it over here somewhere, I'll grab it out in a minute, um, is it's The Photographer's Eye by Michael Freeman. He goes through all this in much more depth, but also gives you um, exercises to um, try for yourself so you can actually um like go through his checklist and try different things on a on one particular scene and what particular what works for you particularly and that's it for the first half any questions absolutely excellent uh, i thought it was brilliant thank you very thank much you. it's such an eye opener um so what's the rest of you guys because i'm going to be going up a step <laughs> 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 um, right thank you i'll let the others ask you questions when when you, can i just ask a question just for yeah. I, I shoot off that you've done the x with the mountain and the the cloud yeah. and the, what was the focal length of the lens was it a, a extremely wide angle lens or? i think it was about a, i think it's it, it would have been down about on a full frame it would have been about 20 or less maybe 18 something like that um, it doesn't have to be that ultra wide angle, but it will. Um, it basically needs to splay them a bit. But you suddenly, it's one of those things you suddenly think, oh, that was it. Clouds are all doing. Yeah, that works. <laughs> no, thank you. Actually, 
absolutely brilliant. I'll let the other guys question this man if you need to. But uh, thank you once again. It's an absolutely brilliant lecture. Thank you. Thank you. I just wish I'd seen it three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just feeling a bit overwhelmed. Go, Chris. Lots of different bits of advice, and I'm going to have to 